Bill Hennessy Place, at the corner of Jackson and Hastings in downtown Vancouver, is one church's attempt to respond to the lack of housing available for low-income people. John Cashore is the superintendent of First United Church in the city's downtown east side. Lawrence Bantelman is the director of the First Church Housing Society, the group which the church formed to create and build the 70-unit housing complex. It's a story of putting one's faith into action, of actually doing something for a segment of society which is becoming increasingly marginalized by government inaction. Bill Hennessy Place will be a place to call home for some 70 of the inner city's residents. The tragedy is that we need a thousand more such units, and that's the pressure point. Hi, I'm Rod Booth, and welcome to The Pressure Point. A few years back, several of us were involved. In fact, in 1976, a few of us were involved in the United Nations Habitat Conference. People from all over the world gathered here in Vancouver to look at the question of housing around the world. I think at that time, John, you were involved in that, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, at that time, I don't think any of us thought the problem would be as acute right here in British Columbia as it turned out to be. And 76 was a while back. I think it was uh, acute then, too, in, in certain areas. Um, perhaps one thing that Habitat did for many of us was to uh, get us uh, thinking uh, in terms of uh, housing in our own communities mm -hmm. and uh, recognizing that uh, there are housing concerns here in this country just as there are in other parts of the world. At that time, 76, were you already working in the downtown east side? No, I wasn't. I was still at Queens Avenue United Church in U.S. Uh, Minster. Oh, yeah, Apple in suburbia, where the only problem was, could you find enough mortgage money to get your house? Well, that was uh, that was certainly a problem, and um, we found that uh, Queens Avenue Church was in a location that uh, on the one side was Queens Park and the very well-established, lovely homes there, mm -hmm. but. Uh, Across 6th Street, there were uh, high-rises going up and many different kinds of apartment buildings, and the nature hmm. of the community was changing. Hmm. So even there, you were up against that? Yes, I think that you'll hmm. find that uh, in most of the, uh, even the suburban communities in the Lower Mainland now. Well, Lawrence, I've just been involved in buying a house because I'm moving to Toronto. Oh, may God have mercy on my soul, but still and all. And you look at the amount of money you have to pay for what is basically concrete and timber and bricks and uh, what a month of a couple of people's time to put it together and, and the price you have to pay is out of all proportion to what's there I mean why is housing so expensive in this country uh, well I, I, I think it differs from city to city uh, certainly if you look at the CNHC's uh, it's Canada Mortgage and Housing's what they call maximum unit price it is significantly less in Toronto than it is here. And I think that might have to do with land prices mm. in, in British Columbia, certainly in Vancouver, and certainly in downtown Vancouver. And I suppose a lot of it also has to do with the, the cost of labor. Is, let's, let's deal with that question of land prices, because it seems to me that that's the thing which seems to have absolutely no bearing to what's on it. Um, in land, I guess because it's a scarce commodity in the sense that if you draw the boundary of a city to be thus and so, there's only so much land within it. Uh, I mean. Are there other societies that have a different way of dealing with the cost of land, or do they all have the same problem we do? Well, I, I think they all, we all have a problem, sim similar problem. I think in our case in Vancouver, the, the problem is compounded by the geography of Vancouver being, as we know, a peninsula mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. into which everything funnels uh, from the suburban uh, town sites around, around Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Everybody comes into the city and, of course, uh, all the major industry is, is located on that peninsula. In the downtown area where we work, um, uh, land has always been a precious commodity, and I think it's going to be even more precious, so I'm very uh, happy and grateful that First United Church got into acquiring that particular piece of property. I was going to ask, what did you have to pay for that piece of property that, that Bill Hennessy Place is going to be on? We don't own it? the property. Oh, you the don't own the property? No. The city of Vancouver is the, the owner of the land. We have oh. pre-leased the land for 40 years for a sum of $500,000. The city bought the land for $625,000. So in effect, that's, is that one of the city's grants towards Hennessy Place? No, not at all. <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> 
I tried to make them look <laughs> no. good. No. Why, what do you mean, not at all? Well, the city owns the land, mm -hmm. and the city gets prepaid a nice sum of money, and the city gets paid full taxes. We're a non-profit, but that doesn't mean you don't pay taxes. Oh, I see. Uh, we pay for everything. We don't even get uh, our development permit application fee waived. Uh, and in the end, the city gets the building. Which is getting a very good deal then. An excellent deal. Uh, huh, huh. Well, I mean, are there any good guys in this thing at all, John? I mean, other than you? Well, yes, there are. And uh, certainly there are uh, good people at City Hall that have been very helpful in this, in this whole process, as there are good people in CMHC. Um, but given, given that and recognizing that, that we're all very fine people working with each other and, uh, and being nice to one another, uh, we run into bureaucratic regulations that uh, make the, the going a, a little difficult and frustrating sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, when we look at the property there at the corner of Hastings and Jackson, um, we uh, were told by some people who have been in similar projects that really the First United Church Housing Society should end up holding the land and owning it and not mm -hmm. the city. Mm -hmm. And we got to thinking about that and thought, well, you know, it really would be inappropriate for us as a society dedicated to providing housing for low-income people to get into a hassle over who would end up owning the land. Uh, one of our values is that really the land belongs to God. It's there as a resource. It's there for the good stewardship uh, for God's people. So we made a decision at one of our board meetings that we wouldn't get into a hassle with the city of Vancouver over who would end up the land, owning the land. Although we did decide, and we still intend to do this, to go to City Hall at some time in the near future and ask them to dedicate that land even after the lease uh, time is mm -hmm. ended and after the mortgage is paid off in perpetuity to housing for low-income people. Do you we think th they'll do that? Well, I think this council would. And uh, I, I think the next uh, council might overturn. Well, uh, you never know. Yeah, we don't know yeah, what yeah. kind of a council we're going to have in 40 years. You hope that there will be values um, operating in the minds of the mm -hmm. councillors at that time mm -hmm. that are similar to uh, the values that I think are there now. And that is that there is a very real uh, need for housing for low income people because of the uh, disastrous tragedy that's taking place. Uh, people because of some economic factors are mm -hmm. being forced out of their habitation. Human beings who have lived in a very stable community, in this case the downtown east side, are being forced to leave home. Some of them are old timers. Some of them are people who've worked in the resource industries of British Columbia. Mm -hmm. I wanted to pick up on that because uh, it relates to Lawrence's earlier mm -hmm. comment that in the downtown you know, you've only got so much land. I mean <coughs> So it, it's, it's too bad that they've been there for a long time, but then people have had to move out of other neighborhoods. What's so sacred about those people staying in that particular location? Well, um, I think the word sacred is a good word. I believe that neighborhood is sacred and that uh, within our uh, values as a Christian community, we do uh, recognize a kind of sanctity around community. Uh, therefore, if neighborhoods are going to change and going to be forced to move, mm -hmm. it should be on the basis of an element of choice. In other words, uh, if I wanted to move away from where I live in Coquitlam, it would probably be because of the choice of finding a new job or other circumstances. What if they put a superhighway through your house? You'd still have to move? Yes, that would be true, but I would still be working from a position of strength. Well, now that's true. The people mm -hmm. in the downtown east side, by and large, are people who are not working from a position of strength. They, these are people who, uh, uh, by and large, are on some form of income assistance. Mm -hmm. It could be disability allowance. It could be um, a single mother on welfare with two or three dependent children. Mm -hmm. These are people who are in that community who very much need that community. Uh, and despite what a lot of people think when they drive down Hastings Street, it is a very viable community with good uh, amenities. A lot of people don't yeah. understand that, I think, as you drive by. But what about that question of good amenities? One of the arguments I remember hearing in Toronto, Lawrence, from people who were, who suggested, in fact, they did, I think, built some low-income housing units way out in the suburbs. People got out there and couldn't afford the transportation to get into the amenities in that sense. Is that an argument for that community staying where it is? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, 
uh, a lot of the people, uh, most of the people I think live there because they're poor people. And again, uh, they cannot afford to take too many buses. Uh, so mm -hmm. everything is within walking distance mm -hmm. uh, and uh, within fellowship. Their, their friends have lived there a long time, but certainly the amenities of downtown are close by and you don't have to spend any money getting to it. Uh, that is one of the major reasons I think there is stability in that community. Mm -hmm. There's also comradeship there, mm -hmm. great, great fellowship and comradeship in that community. Yes, that's tremendously important. Uh, you know, one of the things we're thinking about here, Ron, if, if you consider, uh, for instance, a person who uh, perhaps is on medication for some kind of uh, uh, mental illness, uh, p perhaps it might be chronic brain syndrome or, or some kind of, uh, 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 of a deficiency in, in one's brain function, mm -hmm. and that person is maintained in the community on medication, has learned where his or her friends are, uh, where a pub is that they can drop in and, and uh, be accepted, where the community care team is, where the social welfare office is, um, where the church is, and therefore they have a community network. Mm -hmm. Now, you move that person out to uh, another area and very quickly things will start to break down. Mm. Uh, loneliness will set in, despair, perhaps uh, stopping taking medications. Pretty soon that individual has to be taken into care. I, I believe that the downtown east side is uh, uh, one of the reasons it's uh, economically important to the p citizens of British Columbia is that it helps to enable people to live in community without having to be institutionalized. But these some of the reasons why you decided to, to get First United Church into a housing, into the housing business. I mean that's what fairly high-risk game to get into. Didn't you at one time consider tearing the church down itself? Yes, we did. Uh, those were in uh, the days of uh, the early 1980s when uh, property uh, values were much higher. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that uh, thinking of the stewardship of land, there were some questionable things happening in terms of real estate flips and massive profits being made. Mm -hmm. And land values were going sky high and people were trying to get rich quick on it. Mm -hmm. And this again was impacting very, very badly on the people of the area. Mm -hmm. At that time, we thought that the needs were there, but we needed some data to really be able to demonstrate it. And that's when we um, managed to ask uh, Lawrence to undertake to prepare a study on the housing stock for low-income people in the area. What did you discover, Lawrence? Well, I worked in, in Artifest Church and in the downtown east side in the early 70s, and I'd worked in Kitsilano. Um, what I tried to do in that report, which is called No Lasting City, by the way, um, what I tried to do was give an overview mm -hmm. um, of what was happening in Vancouver uh, and then a view focusing in on what was happening in the downtown east side and then a further focusing in on that particular site at 320 East Hastings where First Church is. Um, what we found was that across the country, across Canada, uh, many United Churches had gone into such projects, either they had torn down uh, the buildings uh, they mm -hmm. had or they had built on property that mm -hmm. they had. So it was, it was not new, but certainly in the downtown east side for First Church, which is a very daring church, as you know, to even suggest that, uh, caused a lot of um, uh, shock waves. I mean, did these others go into low-income housing in the same way that you were proposing? Yes, they did. Mm. That, that is my understanding. Uh, spe special needs housing are the seniors or the mm -hmm. handicapped. Mm -hmm. uh, ours is, is, a, is a different kind of project because it way? is. It, well, from the start, we, the board has said, there's a board of directors, and they mm -hmm. have said we don't want an age ghetto, and we don't want an income ghetto, and we don't want uh, a, a health ghetto, and mm -hmm. we don't want a, a culture ghetto. That is, you know. But you you haven't, know. haven't you already got sort of a culture ghetto, whether you want it or not, just by the fact that you're going to try to build it in that existing community and maintain that community standards? No, I, I think the applicants and the choice of applicants uh, really reflects the community. It's it's mm. amazing. We do have an overwhelming. But you have no millionaires moving in. Oh no. Oh, that's true. Well, I, I think we've run into some problems with the, the, the <laughs> with the lease with the city and I certainly think. with the operating agreement with the CMAC. We'd like someone like some millionaire who doesn't want to move in to to uh, help those people in there who cannot afford to pay even the low end of market rent that would be very nice but no we don't have any millionaires in there okay but it is a cross-section 
at this point. Of, of, the, of that community. Of that community, yes. right. Mm -hmm. well, let's back up for a moment and then come back to that one. I, I want to find out how, so, so Lawrence does this study. It says there's a need. Um, but look, I've been on church boards before. You don't move them that easily. What was the process of getting the board from Lawrence's report to the decision they ought to really do something about it? Well, um, we, we received Lawrence's report, and it very graphically pointed out uh, that there was a crisis in housing for the people of the area. We started getting letters from older people uh, saying, say, this is a really tremendous report that you've prepared here. Uh, thank you for doing this. We will do everything we can to help uh, assure that, uh, that some of these situations are, uh, mm -hmm. are helped. And um, so we got to thinking about it, and we decided to... Um, ask Lawrence to uh, work for another month at seeing if we could put together some kind of a basic organization that could try to take on a specific project. Mm -hmm. It would mean getting in touch with Canada Mortgage and Housing, uh, getting some units dedicated uh, to our society, but we thought, let's go for it. So we did, and lo and behold, uh, we were able to come up with some volunteers to become members of the board. Now at that time, uh, property values were so high mm. that we were prepared to say that we wanted Lawrence to do further study on the available building sites in the area. But one day I just sort of uh, said as an aside, and by the way, Lawrence, I think it would be okay to consider that uh, lot at the corner of Hastings and Gore, which happens to be <laughs> where, the church where we are. I, I, th yeah. I thought it was the lot, empty lot across the street, uh, and then it hit me. Well, yeah, well it hit a few of us when we heard it, too. <laughs> because that building's only 20 years old, That's but right. uh, Lawrence uh, went over and talked to CMHC, and they were very interested in that. Hmm. And at that time, that was almost viable, but hmm. not quite. Why? Uh, because the community, uh, we did another survey in the community and said, if we were to tear down First Church, how would you feel about that? Mm -hmm. And what would you feel needed to be built into the new building as a real minimum in mm -hmm. terms of what First United Church is now providing for this community? And they came back and they said, uh, we think that that sanctuary is very important. It doesn't need to be that large, but we need the sanctuary. We need places where we can go and have meetings. We want you to continue to do your advocacy work among uh, people who are having difficulty with red tape. Uh, we want there to be the outreach school, which is operated by the Vancouver School Board. It's an alternate school. Uh, we want the services that you are presently providing to remain, but if you are able also to put housing up above, that's great. But mm -hmm. the community uh, gave us quite a vote of confidence. Yeah, in, in fact, that you'd survey. have had to rebuild another church and the housing as well. So yes, yeah. and uh, so when we put those numbers together, uh, the, our architects really were excellent and tried very hard, but it just didn't quite work. It would have meant the rents would be too high. Mm -hmm. How did you finally financially, Lawrence, put together Hennessy Place? Uh, what, CMHC you talked to right at the beginning? Uh, yes, CMHC at the very start was very enthusiastic and very supportive mm -hmm. all the way through. Uh, we've had many project offices. When, when we found that the idea and the proposition was not going to work on the 320 East Hastings site, that there was a gap, financial gap, that is the church site, we immediately again looked at where we are now, mm -hmm. which we looked at a year earlier. Uh, at the asking price at that time was $1.3 million, ah. which is you know totally out of the question if you want to provide low rents. Mm -hmm. I mean, some things, the, the land is a very important factor mm -hmm. in, in, in the rent structures. So we uh, immediately asked the CMHC if we could shift the 70 unit allocation we'd got. Down 70 units, you mean you could build 70 units of housing? That's is that right. That's what you're talking about? That's right. One That's bedroom, right. two bedroom, or do they define that? Yeah, they, no. They, they don't define it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have to break it out. Okay. Uh, we have studios, one bedrooms, and two bedrooms. And uh, luckily, we fit it into the zoning. There's a special zoning on that strip of, of Hastings Street between Maine and Heatley, I believe. Uh, the zoning is the same. Hmm. What's called the FSR, which is a technical planning term called the floor space ratio, was the same. So as which long as the numbers worked, the CMHC said, it was fine. And the numbers seemed to work. And the land, when we got it, was, was, was much cheaper than what it was going for a year before. So you got CMHC, you got the city. What about the province? Nothing from the province. Yet? Nothing. We, we, we have no dealings with the... Did you try? Well, for our kind of pro project, which is not uh, specific, like it's not, it's not a, 
a project for seniors or it's not a project for the handicapped. It's, it's for everyone. It's an apartment building. Well, it didn't with lower fit, rents. It didn't fit somebody's That's category. Right. Actually, there is a way in which provincial policy has uh, b had a negative effect. How's that? Uh, the freezing of welfare rates uh, means that people's shelter allowance has not increased in the past uh, few years. Uh, our predictions that enabled us to uh, get an idea of what our end rent structure would be uh, were based on being somewhat. Uh, so, something of an increase in the shelter allowances so like each year. Five percent a year, or the five yes, and six. Would yes, yes, we weren't expecting too. it to be great, but uh, when uh, when this did not happen, it threw our numbers out of uh, kilter. And what about the recent even cutback on, on on I presume some of your people might fit into the categories that now have even been cut back if they're welcome. Yes, some of the younger people in the building yeah. under twenty five yeah. uh, yeah. selected will be affected. Now, how do you make that up then? Well. As John said, when we started the project, we said that in 1984, hopefully the welfare rate, or the shelter portion of the welfare assistance rate, which is the baseline, mm -hmm. would, would be $240. The CMHC says the low end of market for that particular kind of unit is $230. We have a lot of people who can fit into the $230 ca ca category. We have as many people who can pay less than $230, $200. Some people only pay $87 a month. Uh, because they're old age, uh, getting old age pension, mm -hmm. so you have to income test them. You can't take more than 25% of their income. So there is a problem there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in, in a building like Bill Hennessy Place, in the area that it is, uh, great moral uh, dilemmas start to happen because you say, should you ask uh, this unit, which has got a poor family in it, to accept an extra rent so you can get Somebody even Some poorer. even poorer yeah. in at the other end. As I, as I recall, not bef too long before we taped this, um, uh, one of the provincial men ministers uh, took you on for uh, getting too political, where the church should be doing charity. How the hell do you do charity in this way unless you're political? Well, yes, and the other thing about that is, is that we do do charity. It's that we feel that charity uh, has some uh, aspects to it that aren't, uh, aren't that helpful when it seems to... Uh, make some people second-class citizens by saying mm -hmm. these people can eat the discarded food that uh, that we don't uh, want to eat in our house so that we will give away. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, uh, we are involved in charity, but we feel that we also have to call on um, God, whose love is justice, uh, to help all of society participate in, uh, in justice for all. Uh, one of the really soul-destroying things about this whole experience, Rod, is um, having 500 applicants for 70 units and having had to cut off the applications uh, some time ago because, uh, I mean, if, if we left them open, uh, who yeah, knows how many thousand. Would be, What would you do yeah, then? You wouldn't yeah, be able yeah. to stop. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's this situation that, um, that, you know, people are really desperate and it it will appear to a great many people that it's been unfair that they weren't selected. Uh, you know, people who are quite desperate. Hmm. Uh, it's interesting though, the means test really means that uh, in this case to qualify, you have to be the worst off. In other words, if you have a hot plate, that rate's higher than having a small stove. Uh, okay. No, definitely. The, 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 you've got some pictures here of the units and um, or not of the units because they're being made, but of the sod turning and those marvelous paintings that you had on, on the hoardings. That was a marvelous idea. Whose idea was that? Well, we got a, a Canada Employment Immigration Department grant, which was construction related, that mm -hmm. is to make work that was related to Bill Hennessy Place, either the building thereof and later, of course, the furnishings thereof. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought that the, the hoarding is going to get mucked up anyway. <laughs> So we might as well get it artistically uh, <laughs> mucked up, so to speak. And then in the end, we could, with the permission of the contractor, move some of those excellent uh, murals in, into the building itself. Are it's you going to be able to do that, to move some of the murals? If, if they're saved, if they're not kicked through, and if the contractor doesn't want to use them on the next site. You're talking of interior decorating, as you were showing me in this other album, some beautiful uh, uh, chests and cabinets and screens and so on that are already have already been made. That's Who right. made these? These were made by a workshop we had downstairs, uh, again under that same Canada Employment and Immigration uh, grant. Um, the majority of them were 
Chilean refugees, uh, and very, very high quality work. Uh, it was designed by, by staff of the society working on that program. Mm. Uh, they're soft furnishings. They are um, things that, that we felt that would make the building not look so so institutional. It's, it's not going to be concrete and steel, is it? It's, I, I mean, the people I would suspect who have been selected already feel that this is their home. Well, that process is underway. That process is underway. No one has been selected yet, but by, by the end of March, we hope people will be selected. But yes, we have one old gentleman. He's 84 years old. He's, a, I think, a Canadian institution. He was a Bernardo kid. He lives in the building right next to Bill Hennessy Place, in the Jackson Rooms. He has to go up one floor to use the washroom, and he watches that building. He has been watching that building since the hole was dug. He knows everything. He is really our site he's supervisor. Yeah, he's the contractor has been slipping up. He know, tell listen, you. he's he's <laughs> told us so and so's taking eleven bricks off the site. <laughs> you know, do something about it. John, we just got about a minute, but tell me, Bill Hennessy, who you decide to name over. I know who Bill was. Some of our people might not. Want to say a word about Bill? Uh, Bill Hennessy was a community worker at First United Church. Uh, he he was a war vet. He's a person who's well known to people on Skid Road in Vancouver. Uh, he's recognized as a person who could get through red tape faster than anybody else, especially when it came to Department of Veterans Affairs work. We still have people coming into First United Church and saying, may I see Bill Hennessy? And we say, well, we're sorry Bill hasn't been here since 1980. Uh, but Bill very kindly uh, allowed us to use his name uh, for this project. Uh, he tried to talk us out of it. He Is thought right? somebody else must, there must be somebody more deserving. But we thought that he represented the essence of what this project was about. Uh, we weren't looking for some big name, famous person, or, or some church dignitary. We wanted someone who was identified with the grassroots of the downtown east side. Mm -hmm. It would help to represent to the community some of the really noble things that are a part of that community and that one has the privilege of seeing when one can be there for a while. Hmm. So it was a great, and he was there for the sod turning, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Yes. Well, was he there? I uh, yes, he was. Yes, he was. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There were so yeah. many people at yeah. the sod turning. Yeah. Lawrence, will there be a model here now that other people could follow? Uh, we hope so. We we think we've broken ground, uh, literally and and physically. Um, there are challenges still. It's not easy. Uh, mm. And of course, uh, we're only at the start. This project, you know, the building goes on for 40 years. The lease goes on, and mm -hmm. the building will stand for 100 years. So mm -hmm. we hope that the ownership will transfer to the people living in that building. Mm. Uh, and then that will be even a greater example of what can be done. Will they run it themselves once they're in there? How will that happen? We are hoping they will have vital interest and concern in the operations of the building. We will take care of the finances. Hopefully, in the second or third year, when things have settled down a bit and you know the mm -hmm. wrinkles are out of the way, then they can form their own society. And First United Church Social, Social Housing Society can just hand the whole thing over to them. And we'll come down with the Pressure Point crew and visit Bill Hennessy Place. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining us tonight at the Pressure Point. Pressure Point is a production of Interchurch Television cooperative venture of Anglican, United, Roman Catholic, Presbyterian, Lutheran, and Baptist churches in the Vancouver Lower Mainland. We welcome your comments and your inquiries concerning the program. You may contact us at 1955 West 4th Avenue, Vancouver, V6J1M7, or call us at 738-1133.